I'm Keith Woodward. Um, yes, I'm a professor of geography and social theory here um, uh, at UW, and it's so nice to see so many people um, uh, showing up for this event, um, including comrades that I can see from places like um, Penn State and elsewhere. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be able to um, uh, to introduce the first of two talks from um, my comrade um, Ann Bonds from uh, UW Milwaukee, uh, uh, who is one of the um, the first, you know, one of the first kind of Wisconsin geographic faces that I remember from um, from uh, from arriving here at Wisconsin and being active during the capital struggles and stuff. Um, our capital occupation included, you know, lots of folks with baby strollers and other things, which I think is what you had at the time. And if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so it's nice to see everyone, and I'm so grateful that Anne has agreed to um, to come here to share her work with us. Um, Anne, um, Anne Bonds is an associate professor of geography uh, and urban studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, she's a feminist geographer whose research uh, interests include race and racialization, urban political economy and community development, and critical carceral studies. Uh, she's a recent, um, recently appointed editor, I believe this year, um, is that correct, of um, Urban Studies um, and chair of the Urban uh, Geography Specialty Group at the Association of American Geographers. Um, she's co-chair of the Critical Prison Studies Caucus of the American Studies Association and a senior fellow at the UWM Center for Economic Development. Um, uh, uh, Professor Bonds is also co-founder of Transforming Justice, a youth-centered project exploring policing and segregation in Milwaukee through storytelling and documentary filmmaking. Uh, she's also a co-PI uh, on a project called Mapping Racism and Resistance in Milwaukee County, a project uh, mapping all racially restrictive covenants filed in Milwaukee County and uh, Black resistance to them between the years 1910 and 1960. And her research has been published in a variety of um, uh, major outlets, including the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, um, Progress in Human Geography, where she's currently um, uh, doing a series of progress, amazing progress reports on race and ethnicity, and a number of other um, uh, great journals. And I um, highly recommend you to um, check out her work. It's amazing. And it's so wonderful to have you here. I've said that several times now, but thank you. Thank you for being here. And it's great to see you again. And with that, with that I will hand it over. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Keith, uh, for that really warm introduction. Um, thank you also, Patrick, for your introduction um, and also uh, for everybody involved in organizing today's event. Um, I, I am really distinctly honored to be here today and humbled too. Um, and um, I have to begin with all the caveats that um, I really wish that I could be uh, speaking with you all in person um, on this beautiful spring day, but I'm lucky that we have these digital platforms that allow these kinds of conversations. Um, just a note before I get started, um, the talk that I give, I'm giving today is, is more of a theoretical talk. I'm, I'm engaging more um, with questions about how we might understand white supremacy and its reproduction over time. And um, my my, uh, my talk tomorrow will be more empirical, uh, focus more specifically on the way in which um, the proprietary logics of white supremacy, as I discuss in more detail today, the way that they're produced in the city of Milwaukee. So I'm going to really quickly uh, share my screen here, and then we can get started. Everybody see this okay? All right. This quote from W.E.B. Du Bois comes in from the second chapter of his 1920 book called Dark Water, Voices from Within the Well. And this particular essay is called The Souls of White Folks. In the essay, Du Bois conceptualizes what he terms as, quote, the religion of whiteness within the context of Jim Crow, World War I, imperial expansion, and anti-colonial anti struggles. And in this analysis, he's connecting global and domestic forms of oppression and resistance. He begins the essay emphasizing that he is, quote, clairvoyant in his understanding of whiteness. 
He argues that he's able to see white entrails because of a subject position, which necessitates an ability to see through the attitudes, technologies, and mechanizations of whiteness. Like so many others, I'm really drawn to this essay, not just because of the precision and enduring relevance of Du Bois's critique, but also because in this piece, he charts a knowledge and ideology of white supremacy and its historical conditions, developing a framework that political theorist Ella Meyer calls white dominion. Du Bois's reflections extend beyond his more well-known critique of the public and psychological wages of whiteness in a system of racial capitalism. And this is what Robin D.G. Kelly has called the paltry dividend. So he extends beyond this to analyze what Meyer calls, quote, the property, proprietary, excuse me, orientation of modern whiteness. Du Bois exoriates not just irrational hate, but also a global system of exploitation and dispossession structured around white ownership and entitlement and the material benefits and status associated with it. The proprietary orientation of whiteness is a theme that will be central to my two talks this week as a Haven, Haven's Right Center uh, visiting lecture. But what is whiteness that one should desire, he asks. Oop, let's see if I can get my screen to go. There we go. Oh, there's always a technological issue. Here we go. But what is it, I'm gonna start over here. What is it that whiteness, uh, what is whiteness that one should desire it, he asks. Then, and always somehow, some way, silently but clearly, I'm given to understand that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. Today, I'd like to think through the proprietary orientation of whiteness within the context of resurging white supremacy, expanding neoliberal precarity, and the privatization of social reproduction, and what I'm referring to here as privatized mutuality. My focus today is not on Trumpism per se, or any kind of so-called Trump doctrine, but rather on contemporary logics of gender, race, and capitalism, and the contradictions of our time, including, of course, the ascendance of the far right, extremes of wealth inequalities, the violence of the state and its abandonment of caretaking responsibilities, and the growing significance of aggressive and hostile individualism. The lethal racial political economy of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is both working through and intensifying uh, processes of social differentiation, has laid bare the myths of expendability underlying gender racial capitalism and the ways in which white supremacy and whiteness orient the state and access to the distribution of life making and sustaining resources. And yet, in an era of neoliberal multiculturalism, a time in which racism is individualized and the state is officially anti-racist, the dividends of whiteness, however paltry, are no longer guaranteed. And white supremacy exceeds the category of whiteness with, with a flexibility that increasingly incorporates non-white others. And here, of course, we see Enrique Tarrio, uh, the leader of the Proud Boys. Uh, Dylan Rodriguez refers to this condition as multicultural white supremacy. Uh, Christina Beltran calls it multicultural whiteness. Um, and this is something I'll take up a little bit later. Whiteness, as Daniel Martinez Hosung and Joseph Lowndes argue, is increasingly tied to racial marginalization, even as it relies upon anti-Black racism and reinforces longstanding tropes about poverty and precarity. So in exploring questions of white supremacy, race, gender, and reproduction today, my aim is not to provide any definitive answers, but rather to consider the ways in which struggles over whiteness and white supremacy are being broadly defined in this historical moment. My focus on reproduction, um, it, it, my focus on reproduction sits within dual registers. I'm emphasizing here both the reproduction of regimes of race and capital social relations, as well as the socially necessary labor to sustain lives, households, communities, and to generate the conditions necessary for capitalist production. My attention here is not on indiv individual homes as sites of racialized and feminized unpaid labor, 
necessary for the reproduction of gendered and racial capitalism. But rather today, I want to think at the scale of the city and think about the ways in which forms of privatized mutuality limit access to the means of social reproduction in ways that underlie white supremacy's continuities. So my analysis, my analysis today is situated within the fields of critical ethnic studies, critical theories of race and geography, feminist political economy, and feminist geography. Um, I am especially engaged with scholars tracking the recalibration of whiteness and white supremacy within shifting patterns of racialization and regimes of race. And I draw from feminist theories engaging with questions about life's work um, and the dialectical tensions between that work and um, capitalist production in the context of neoliberal economic restructuring and the precariousness of everyday life. So throughout this talk, I emphasize gendered racial capitalism. And I do this to underscore the mutual articulation of race, gender, and class, and the notion that categories do not exist. These categories do not exist in isolation, but rather they come into being in, through and in relation to one another. So in combining feminist political economy and theories of racial capitalism, um, I'm underscoring how capitalism is organized by both racism and patriarchy, patriarchy, excuse me, grounded um, in the differential valuation of women, um, of women's of socially reproductive labor and of others deemed non-productive within capitalism. And I wanna just pause and add an asterisk here and just note that um, when I use the term women um, throughout this talk, my goal is not to create uh, or reproduce uh, an essentialist category or a binary understanding of gender, um, but rather here I'm underscoring how the normative logics of gender reproduce the category of woman and assumptions about femininity and labor within capitalism. So in my remaining time today, um, I'd like to begin with a rethinking of white supremacy, one grounded in analysis of gendered racial capitalism that challenges the common sense understandings of white supremacy that have emerged during the era of Trump and the weeks following the January 6th insurrection. Here I make three arguments. First, Contemporary forms of white supremacy are not simply a throwback to yesteryears or previous decades or generations of white supremacy. Whiteness and white supremacy ha have been and are continuously reworked and reformulated and must be situated within a context of expanding precarity and what Melissa Harris Perry has identified as, quote, the blackening of America, end quote, which she understands as a time in which the inter interrelated forms of vulnerability and abandonment that have long defined the conditions of black life in the United States are increasingly relevant to the broader pop white population. And this is something that Hosang and Lowndes theorize as a dynamic form of quote, racial transposition, end quote. And within this, they argue, uh, forms of racial thinking and identification can be transferred from one group or context to another. Second, um, I contend that contemporary forms of white supremacy, what we're seeing today, of course, are part of a much, much longer racial and political economic project, but they can be usefully illuminated through an examination of the post-World War era of publicly subsidized resegregation and the emergence of increasingly privatized modalities of so social reproduction. And that is what I refer to here as privatized mutuality. Privatized forms of mutuality uh, bolster the reproduction of predominantly white communities, um, capturing and containing critical infrastructures and resources that are essential for the conditions for sustaining everyday life. Though I don't discuss this here in this particular talk, I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A. Um, it's really important here to emphasize how the coercive powers of the state sustain these geographies. And then finally, um, I conclude, um, and this is a really kind of provisional inclusion, uh, conclusion, but I conclude by arguing that care and collective forms of mutuality are essential for destabilizing the reproduction of whiteness and white supremacy and these privatized forms of mutuality. 
I make this argument with a uh, feminist ambivalence about care and its contemporary articulations within gendered racial capitalism, which of course uh, it market in the current moment as simultaneously oppressive and exploitative, joyful, and a form of resistance that extends from the human to the non-human. Instead, I argue that feminists and abolitionist insights provide us with the tools to unsettle white supremacy and to imagine relations of care and relationality that are not feminized, racialized, or confined to the human. I'd now like to shift my, my focus after this long introduction to discuss uh, white supremacy in precarious times. In the weeks since the January insurrection at the Capitol, there's been extraordinary interest among the media and much of the public about resurging white nationalisms and white supremacy in the United States. In fact, in his inaugural address on January 20th, President Joseph Biden, discussing how racism has long deferred the dreams of so many, identified, quote, a rise in political extremism, white supremacy, and domestic terrorism end quote, as key issues that the country must, quote, confront and defeat, end quote. This reference to white supremacy um, in an inaugural speech is unprecedented. Um, the term, not surprisingly, has never been mentioned in an inaugural, inaugural address in the 243 years since the establishment of the U.S. racial settler state. Biden's use of the term signals a shift in the nation's politics and racial lexicons, especially in the context for the movement for Black Lives and the massive social movements of 2020, um, when demonstrators took to the streets to protest policing and the violence of the carceral system, following the killings, police killings of George, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless others. And in Milwaukee, uh, these, these, this movement's especially focused on uh, Alvin Cole, Joel Avicido, and Jacob Blake. These protests, of course, emerged uh, just as massive layoffs and furloughs were displacing COVID-19 economic threats onto already precarious working people. A group, um, oh, this was a period of time in which essential workers, a group comprised disproportionately of low-income people of color and women, were forced into unsafe and unregulated workspaces as the unhoused and the housing insecure faced new dislocations in the form of evictions, shelter closures, and the loss of critical social services. And I think it's, it's really important and, and worth pausing here to note that, of course, during the same period of time, um, the world's richest men uh, saw their fortunes grow by $600 billion. The mobilizations of 2020 connected police brutality and racialized systems of control and surveillance to the uneven geographies of the COVID-19 pandemic, exposing how ostensibly legitimate forms of state violence, and here I'm talking about um, policing, mass criminalization, uh, the vicious suppression of peaceful protest, so these work hand in glove with the state with state abandonment and disinvestment in ways that consign large populations to live shortened lives. And so refreshing as though it may have been to hear President Biden recognize both the ascendancy of the far right and the significance of white supremacy, especially following the events of January 6, and after enduring four years of a president who notoriously referred to the neo-Nazi alt-right demonstrators at the 2017 Charlottesville Unite the Right rally as quote, very fine people, end quote, and who instructed the Proud Boys to quote, stand back and stand by when asked to disavow white supremacy during a presidential debate. Yet despite this, my colleague Josh Inwood and I argue that there is a real danger in reducing white supremacy to Trumpism and to militias and mobs and insurrectionists and to extraordinary events like those on January 6th. Make no bones about it. Trump catalyzed and legitimated a reactionary white heteromasculinist politics, often mobilizing white male grievances and injury and strategically deploying what Polito, Bruno, Fabier Serna and Galantine call transgressive racism or spectacular racism. 
Yet we argue that distilling white supremacy to these forms risks the potential of obscuring white supremacy's liberal foundations and its everyday production um, and reproduction and system systemic deployments. And so as noted by philosopher Charles Phil Fit Mills, what we are witnessing right now may be a broader recognition of white supremacy as a racial ideology. And even this we might argue is quite limited. But we are absolutely under no circumstances experiencing a reckoning with white supremacy as a social system producing and sustaining white domination. So rather than reducing white supremacy to fringe movements, to equating it to a racial ideology of a political or political extremism, Josh and I have argued that we must instead understand it as a logic and relation of power, a historically dynamic form of socio-spatial organization situated within capitalist social relations and across a broad political spectrum, an array and an array of identities that are mutually articulated. Whiteness is not simply a racial category or an identity, but rather a structured relationship that produces differential life chances and material advantages. Its meanings and affiliations have always been contested and in flux. Yet because whiteness is associated with material benefits and advantages, it is a highly uh, valued asset and identity. Generations of possessive investments in whiteness, and here I'm referring, of course, to the work of George Lipsitz and Cheryl Harris, investments in these paltry dividends in the forms of opportunities, mobilities, asset accumulation, have reproduced the structures, relations, and geographies of white supremacy. The genealogies of white supremacy uh, orient the state and the uneven distribution of power, land, and wealth in the United States in specifically racialized ways. It's really important to acknowledge that it can never be reduced to these histories. New categories emerge, new racial categories emerge in specific junctures, redefining non-white groups and systems of exploitation um, while preserving and protecting the value of whiteness. So then, as a contingent and reinventing form, white supremacy should never be reduced to a singular worldview or a political category. Rather, it must be understood as a system of racialized ordering and domination embedded and reproduced within the everyday geographies and operations of the racial set settler state. So situating contemporary forms of white supremacy within the decades after World War II and also the period following the civil rights movement is revealing of some of the transformations that give, are giving rise to this moment. Dylan Rodriguez challenges us to understand these decades as an intensified period of what he calls white reconstruction during which there was significant social and institutional struggle to remake and sustain white supremacy as both domestic and global racial orders were in crisis and the legitimacy of Jim Crow and it's, as a racial system became increasingly untenable. And there's a, a, a huge and wonderful body of work documenting this. Um, so I'm just really touching on this briefly here. Growing demands for liberal recognition and reform and civil rights gains, however delayed and incomplete they may have been, were met with an incredible white counter reaction from conservative forces emerging to challenge movements for racial justice and other cultural transformations in US politics. In fact, George Lipsitz argues that, quote, the most important social mobilization of our time was not the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century, but rather the counter revolution that emerged against it through resistance to school segregation, or excuse me, school desegregation, fair housing and progressive taxation. And that eventually coalesced into a social warrant for competitive consumer citizenship, end quote. The hallmark demands for white activists within the long conservative movement that eventually gave rise to the new right were property rights, low taxes, and the reduction of the size of government. 
things that are obviously quite familiar to us. And as I discuss tomorrow, the metropolitan area of Milwaukee was at the forefront of white conservative reaction against civil rights gains and efforts to desegregate housing and education. Even as, as, even as the city has a rich and storied history of radical social movements, from union struggles and working class movements for labor justice to militant civil rights insurgency, the area is also home to some of the most conservative uh, foundations and think tanks in the country. As in Milwaukee, white uh, grassroots organizations, including neighborhood watch groups, taxpayer alliances, property owners associations, erupted across the nation and mobilized their supporters against public housing, municipal plans for desegregation, and redistributive policies writ large. Uh, two of the most influ influential segregationist organizations during Milwaukee's intense period of white reconstruction uh, were the Affiliated Taxpayers Association and the Milwaukee Property Owners Association, who, as I'll discuss tomorrow, led extremely effective and powerful campaigns to protect white property interests and to limit black mobility and access to resources and infrastructures of social reproduction. Um, and just, just to note this group, um, I, I'm very fascinated with this group. This is actually a youth group. Um, I don't think you can see here, but um, they're called the White Power Rangers. And um, they were a youth group uh, that was a white youth group kind of meant to um, act as a countervailing force against um, uh, the NAACP youth commandos that were marching in protest with Father Grappi and Bell Phillips um, for open housing. So as white people across the country fled from cities to suburban enclaves, seeking the heteropatriarchal white domestic ideal and in resistance to racial integration of housing and education, they erected barriers and fortified their communities against the poor and the non-white and from progressive tax structures and collective re responsibility uh, for shared municipal infrastructures and services. Though practices of suburban bordering and bounding were justified through the logics of individual property rights, as we see here, what Ananya Roy has termed, quote, property citizenship, or, uh, and Maggie Ramirez calls property liberalism. In fact, the resegregation of urban space was and continues to be a publicly subsidized affair. As is well documented, suburbanization gave rise to new and increasingly securitized spatializations of whiteness produced through the accumulation and careful shielding of resources, the exclusion of non-white others and the coercive powers of the state. The racist mechanisms of exclusion producing these geographies are well, doc well documented and took many forms across scales. And I'll be talking more in detail about some of these tomorrow. From federal housing policies, lending uh, practices and their enforcement, to municipal ordinances, annexation and zoning, and to private practices, including of course, individual racism, neighborhood watch groups and real estate agreements. These efforts necessitated cooperation and collective white work, producing a kind of privatized mutuality. And so I use this term privatized mutuality uh, with a dual purpose. First, as a means to think about the time, energy, and collective work devoted to the socio-spatial reproduction of whiteness as a means to um, accumulate assets, protect resources, and critically, to keep them from others. And second, I use this term uh, to refer to the uneven geographies of suburban social infrastructures produced through urban um, racial and class segregation, securitization, and the privatization of social reproduction. The material advantages of whiteness cohere and come together in place, producing what I have elsewhere, elsewhere termed um, possessive geographies, geographies defined by white ownership and control and protected by the state. Though there is substantial evidence of growing suburban precarity and decline, suggesting a softening of suburban boundaries and partitions, this gendered racial spatial nexus 
remains critically salient within discourses of whiteness. Who can forget Trump's promise to save the suburbs last July in his pitch to get great gain traction with white suburban women voters? Trump's portrayal of the, the suburban dream lifestyle, um, I feel like that should have a TM next to it, the suburban dream lifestyle as under siege from affordable housing and the poor that might oc occupy those spaces is critical. As Cheryl Harris notes, this is critical because, quote, the spatial illusion is readily legible as a racial geography of exclusion. Everyone knows what this means, and everyone knows who is being hailed. This time of precarity, I've suggested, has refocused our attention to gendered and racialized reproduction, illuminating questions about who, where, what is reproduced and to what ends. I draw, the, uh, I draw from uh, the, I, I draw on the term precarity in its multiple meanings. Um, and I'm including here uh, feminist theorizations of precarity referring to uh, the increasing flexibilization and contingency of labor markets within late capitalism, what we might call the growing precarity of work itself. Um, I also draw from Judith Butler and others understandings of precarity as a social ontology of mutual dependence. I'm particularly drawn to Waite's definition of precarity as, quote, life worlds characterized by uncertainty and insecurity, end quote. For me, this notion brings together conceptualizations of precariousness in work and precariousness in the condition of life in a time of increasing political, economic, social, and ecological uncertainty. My reference to social infrastructures here refers to the kinds of services and structures that are necessary for the well-being of and for well-being in everyday life. And here I'm including um, education systems, transportation systems, healthcare, parks, recreation, and community services such as after-school programs. Um, and here I've got a picture of the built environment. I've got a picture of a highway building. And I put this in here both to invoke um, road building as systems of transportation, but also think about the kinds of barriers and divides that exist. While social infrastructures are often cast as the kinds of services and facilities that support the so-called good life in cities, as with feminists and other critical urban scholars, I understand these structures and spaces as essential to sustaining collective life. The privatization of social reproduction and the transfer of life-sustaining resources away from marginalized urban populations and the neighborhoods in which they live is itself reproductive of gender, race, and class. Disinvestments in social infrastructures are disproportionately borne by women and low-income people of color. Women, um, the poor, and non-white communities simultaneously have the most limited access to critical infrastructure services, while they also disproportionately shoulder the harms and negative consequences from noxious public works projects built in their communities. And here again, we might think uh, back to um, the highways, uh, we can think of heavily polluting industries, um, lots of examples here. My point is um, that the concentration of social infrastructures in particular places via structures of white supremacy is a key driver in ongoing, uh, the ongoing socio-spatial production of racialized and gendered advantage and disadvantage, creating smooth flows of access to life-sustaining resources and connectivity for some at the expense of others. And I have this picture of housing here. This is housing by Washington Park in Milwaukee, um, because I, I just want to be uh, clear that I'm putting housing within this. I spend a lot of time talking about housing, um, both today and tomorrow. Um, and so this is why I have this image right here. While white supremacist control of the conditions and means of so social reproduction is nothing new, whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. I do want to consider how these historical dynamics have taken on new inflections. The logics and attachments uh, to individual rights, which have, they're nothing new, they've long been central to the workings of white supremacy, 
but they've taken on increasingly intensified and hostile forms within neoliberalism as sharp reductions in, st in state capacities for social welfare have accompanied expanding relations of precarity and have downloaded the costs of reproducing life and capital onto non-white bodies and communities. We cannot separate uh, neoliberal precarity um, from hostile privatism, which has been palpably made manifest over the past year from demands for reopening schools and businesses. Um, and I have to include this picture again, this one circulated, of course, nationally um, from the Brookfield protests in April. Um, so we see these made, uh, you know, the, the calls for reopening businesses um, uh, at the expense of workers, their families and their communities. The state's repeated deployment of individual solutions to manage the collective harms of COVID-19. And to the rejection of any effort or mandate meant to ensure public safety on the grounds of individual rights. And here, of course, I'm referring to the ongoing struggles over mass mandates in Wisconsin and many other states. Vulnerable workers, now deemed essential, uh, increasingly rely upon contingent low-wage jobs as intense neoliberal restructuring engenders uh, rapid expansions of flexible employment systems, the gig economy, and the proliferation of poorly, uh, poorly paid work. Of course, these dynamics have been at the forefront of debates about the uneven impacts uh, of, of the pandemic uh, as parents, and most notably women, absorb the dual crises of reproduction that have materialized since March of 2020. And I might note that this week uh, marks the uh, one year anniversary of, of when things started shutting down. Many of us have been working virtually and have been home with our children since last March. In Milwaukee, stories about residents struggling to pay rent to afford basic necessities and, 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 health, and to access healthcare during a pandemic sit uneasily along headlines announcing the area's hot real estate market. And I think that this most really powerfully illuminates the remarkable contradictions in this historical moment. As thousands of job seekers and the un and underemployed endeavor to secure housing and basic needs in a pandemic, Milwaukee's real estate market is not just stable, but booming, driven primarily by the white professional class whose incomes and provisioning have remained stable, have even grown during pandemic shutdowns. While Black and Latino residents make up just 43% of Milwaukee's total population, 63% of Milwaukee's frontline positions are filled by people of color and a disproportionate number of those workers are women. These are the essential workers who have labored in grocery stores, restaurants and bars, healthcare facilities, meat packing plants, hair salons, social services, and public transit to fulfill the demands of capital and the, cap and the capitalist class at incalculable costs. These workers are not, even, not only at greater risk for being infected by COVID-19, but also face a higher risk of death as compounding and intersectional forms of oppression diminish access to resources and shorten lives. We're witnessing these horrors play out in real time as the violence of atomized social relations reproduce and amplify patterns of preventable and premature death. And as white supremacist social relations reorient regimes of value in the hierarchical ordering of workers' lives while also monopolizing access to and the distribution of life-saving and sustaining resources. I'd like to pause here for us to acknowledge the over 500,000 people's lives that we've lost during the COVID-19 pandemic. And now I'll turn to my conclusion. As I've argued today, privatized forms of mutuality bolster the concentration of wealth and resources in predominantly white communities, capturing and limiting critical infrastructures and resources that are essential conditions for sustaining white supremacy. These are, of course, relational processes. The premium of suburban whiteness, including enhanced access to the means of social reproduction, is subsidized by the ongoing devaluation of the racialized and gendered poor, 
and through restricted access of working class communities of color to life supported capacities and resources. Even so, as I noted at the beginning of this talk, white supremacy exceeds the always changing category of whiteness. As racial politics and identifications are ever more bound up with discourses of colorblindness, property rights, and the dynamics of consumer citizenship, white supremacy is incre increasingly multicultural, appealing to those who find racial grievance at the mere mention of race in an ostensibly uh, post-racial era. And this is a process that um, David Theo Goldberg has referred to as racial Americanization. At the same time, however, the certainty of whiteness, however it is imagined and contested, is less evident within neoliberal capitalism's failure to deliver its promised dividends. In charting these transformations, I don't mean to posit a monolithic whiteness or white, a white supremacy that is, that is inevitable and inescapable. Rather, my points today emphasize what Rodriguez calls white supremacy's dynamic presence. As Harris reminds us, quote, whiteness does not confer immunity on white bodies. Poor and working class whites suffer greatly in all areas. Yet, she argues, whiteness mitigates risk through the racial spatial structures that sort possibilities and distribute, distribute access and opportunity. If these precarious times have exposed our mutual dependence, why then has the collective crisis of COVID-19 brought us to our knees? How can we set unsettle white supremacy and the violent exclusions and privatized mutualities that support its ongoing reproduction? Even as I spent the last 40 minutes discussing the role of white supremacy, uh, uh, discussing white supremacy's ongoing reproduction and displacement, to end my comments here today would not only be inadequate, but also unjust. For in spite of the enduring presence of whiteness and white supremacist soci socio-spatial formations, it has always been a fragile and contested system. What is Trumpism, if not a white heteropatriarchal response to the movement for black lives, to me too, to abolitionist dreams, to indigenous de demands for land back? How might we enliven our relationships to one another to recognize as Sadia Hartman has noted that quote, care is the antidote to violence, end quote. What happens, as Dean, Dean Spade has asked, if we, quote, work together on purpose, end quote? I pose these questions to reiterate that renewed efforts to restore white supremacy, to reject the calls of movements, for, uh, the, reject the movements for justice and the calls of the oppressed, do not and cannot foreclose the demands of those marginalized within gendered and racial capitalism. White supremacy is a contested system that requires ongoing labor and efforts, ongoing efforts to rebuild. And this is something that I've tried to capture with privatized mutuality. Scholarship at the intersection of feminist abol feminism and abolitionism, um, including black feminist uh, abolitionist thinkers, disability justice and queer femme activists, they've advanced new ways of, of theorizing care and relationality that reject crisis-oriented thinking and responses, that in their immediacy, marginalize structural transformation and long-term changes grounded in the principles of care and mutuality, that we all need care and give care. For example, Otto highlights that, quote, crises have become an everyday technique of global governance, authorizing the operation of a more hegemonic legal ordering and reducing, though not eliminating, the space for political contestation and critique, end quote. As Miriam Kaba and Ruth Wilson Gilmore insist, the starting point for unsettling white supremacist carceral futures is recognizing that the system is working exactly as it was meant to. To limit our focus to Trump or to liberal reforms, to rebuilding what we already have, risks reproducing the very racist gendered settler colonial system of control that has given rise to this moment. 
rather than being preoccupied with fixing this now, we must resist the leveraging of crisis to reinforce existing hegemonies and give space for expansive forms of thinking that allow us to envision the world and the systems that we actually want. As Patrice Collins has, or Colors has noted, in order for prisons to be produced, someone had to imagine them and create them. Foreclosing abilities uh, to our abilities to imagine otherwise forestalls other ways of being and relating to one another. And we can embrace different forms of being together that reject individualization. This isn't utopian, but rather a praxis, a practical way of approaching the challenges of our time, emphasizing the building up of relationships and presences, as Gilmore have, has called them, that already exist. Despite the darkness of our times, we can look to Miriam Kaba's insistence that, quote, hope is a discipline, end quote, and work to cultivate everyday non-capitalist relations of relationality that militate against privatized mutuality. I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Wow, well, thank you very much. Uh, that was really fabulous, uh, tremendous. So um, what we're gonna do now, we have about 35 minutes for uh, conversation, a Q and A session. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the way this works, I'm gonna explain just a couple of things. One of which is that, so at the bottom of your screen, there's a menu. And uh, one of those menu items is participants. And if you click on that, you have an option of raising your hand. And that'll alert me that you wanna ask a question. If you're someone who's a little reluctant to go on camera and you have your voice heard, um, you can use the chat function, which is immediately to the right of that. Uh, just write in the question and I will read it out for you. So um, we prefer if you do it on camera, if you are willing to do so and we'll get uh, that captured in the recording. We're gonna take three questions at a time. We've got over 70 people here, which is a really great turnout. And um, we wanna make sure that we get to as many people as possible. So um, three questions at a time. Well, who would like to um, ask a question? Ah, I'm being told that the chat seems to be disabled. Is that the case? Do we have a troubleshooter? Um, well, if that's the case, then do use the participants um, option and raise your hand. Don't be shy. This is All right, Boyd Rossing. Go ahead and act, uh, activate your camera and turn on your microphone, please. I think you have to unmute yourself. There. Uh, well, Anne, I wanna really thank you for this um, presentation. Uh, I think we share a, a lot of interests um, and uh, I, I felt it was really articulate. I appreciated a number of the concepts that you raised in particular, um, the idea of white reconstruction was something new to me and something that makes me give a lot of thought to the real meaning of that. Um, having said all of those um, really positive things, I want to uh, challenge you as someone who is also white and also very concerned about issues of racism, uh, you didn't speak to your whiteness. Um, you didn't um, speak to the role of white people in addressing um, issues of white supremacy and the uh, um, racist systems that they uphold. And um, so I'm gonna challenge you to do that. I think um, there's, there's a critique that could be made that you were um, taking a certain prerogative and presumption that you could speak to these issues without acknowledging your own complicity. And this is something I've faced um, year after year after year as someone who really cares about uh, the black community and issues affecting the black community. Uh, so that's probably enough. But um, as a second part of that, um, 
I think that in addition to all of the ways that white supremacy applex, uh, oppresses the black community, um, it's also important to note that it um, works to erase um, the knowledge that exists in the black community about how to resist white supremacy. Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about um, decoloniality and specific processes um, to try to raise up um, the knowledge that's built into black resistance. So thank you again. Um, I hope you'll take my challenge as, you know, as a polite sort of co-challenge to someone who shares your spirit. Thank you. Um, so again, it, it appears that the chat is now working. So if people want to ask a question through that mechanism, please do. But otherwise, indicate to me that you, through raising your hand on the participants function. Sure. Um, yeah, so thanks, Boyd, uh, for those points. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't explicitly acknowledge my whiteness uh, in the talk. Um, I certainly have done so in my body of scholarship. I always situate myself as, a, you know, a white cisgendered middle class woman and talk about what that means for the work that I do as a scholar of race. Um, and one of the reasons that I do work on questions of white supremacy um, is because um, as a, a white person, you know, this is a, a space in which I can maneuver um, and critique, um, a, you know, a, a number of structures and positions. Um, so I'm not sure if this gets at your point, but yeah, it's, it's this constant struggle as a scholar of race of, of identifying your whiteness, understanding how it benefits you. And I recognize it benefits me as a white academic writing about white supremacy, there are benefits that I, I reap from this. Um, there are, you know, of course, there's a long body of scholarship uh, on uh, the abolition of whiteness, um, on, uh, and, you know, and wrapping, uh, embracing uh, uh, an approach that's often called being a race traitor. Um, and um, I think these are really useful ways um, that people can think about things, but um, I am a person uh, who, who doesn't really un agree that you can just, um, you know, be a traitor to your race. You can't just say, well, I no longer embrace the benefits of whiteness, because once again, that locates whiteness as a, an, an identity and an ideology, something that we can take off and set aside and, and then put back on instead of understanding white supremacy as a social system. This is a social system. And as I noted, it incorporates white people and increasingly within a multicultural society, non-white people as well. Um, so I appreciate your question. Um, and I hope that I've gotten to the main concerns that you ask. Oh, I guess just one other thing um, before we move on. That um, one thing I never wanna um, situate is that white supremacy is this omnipotent force, you know, that's. Um, that's uh, you know kind of uh, everywhere. I want to understand white supremacy is something that's produced through the dialectics of struggle. And so what I'm trying to argue and what I think comes through a little bit more in my talk tomorrow is that white supremacy and white supremacist social formations respond to uh, civil rights movements, to movements for black lives. And that's part of this continuous kind of rearticulation of whiteness at particular moments. Okay, we have another question from Ben, whose last initial is R. Go ahead, Ben. You need to unmute yourself and activate your camera, please. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for uh, a really interesting, engaging talk. I, I'm trying to really understand precisely the, this idea that you're, you're presenting of privatized mutuality, which I think I really, really like. Uh, so I'm going to first say what I think I hear, and then I'm going to ask the question. Um, so I'm I'm hearing in it, especially with your your pointing to housing, uh, this sort of like this conjuncture of uh, a claim to an identity with the use of the power of the state to reinforce uh, material benefits while hiding the material benefits as a thing that gets transmitted through the state. Um, or I, I mean, I, I'm sure it's there's more going on, but th that's kind of what I'm focusing on when I hear it. I was really interested. I really interested to hear you talk about how you see privatized mutuality working in like differentially. Like I'm thinking of you know of like oil royalties and like, but I'm thinking of property ownership and the, the, the ways that like a a landlord has a power relationship to a tenant if they are even if they are white, right? And how 
the things that are creating this privatized mutuality, like housing, like owning resources, is also distancing, right? How, how, how are you thinking about people who are uh, participating in it in this sort of like lower tier, lower rung? Does that make sense as a question? Yes, a fantastic question, Ben. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your thoughts. And um, I have to admit that this idea of privatized mutuality um, is a new one for me. Um, I've been trying to make sense, and as many of us have been over the past year, about both these spatial relationships, um, but also these ways of being <laughs> in white supremacy, these ways of relating to one another, this, um, um, and I don't want to, you know, um, create this idea of a relationship that's unchanging and that's not malleable and porous, but at the same time, to me really seems to resonate and make sense in terms of the way in which kind of resource hoarding works and, and it's a relation of being um, for white people to be with one another. Now, if I understand your question a little bit more, I think you're trying to think like, how does that, how is that? And I don't know if I wanna use the word punctured or but how is that, uh, I don't know, there, there are relations that break through those uh, privatized mutualities um, and, and that those privatized mutualities themselves are hierarchically ordered. Am I right there, Ben, that that's what you're thinking of? Yeah, but also how it seems that privatized mutuality can paper over those hierarchies. Yes, yes exactly. So that, so that um, you know, paying your landlord is just the way it is instead of a relation of power um, that actually benefits the accrual of resources. I've got you. Okay. So um, I think I need to take your question and think about it a little bit more to actually expand this thought. And um, my goal with this talk was actually to get feedback on some of these ideas, especially this one in particular. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you kind of a non-answer because I feel as though I need to sit with it. And I'm hoping that I can um, follow up with you and discuss this in more detail. Or if you want to you want to attenuate it in any way or, or offer any uh, follow-up to it, we could do that as well. I love the follow-up. It's very helpful, I think, in thinking about uh, differential access to oil in my research. And I don't mm -hmm. know what it means yet, but I'm very excited to think with your concept. Excellent. Well, let's keep talking about this then. Yes. All right. Uh, who else do we have that would like to ask a question? Um, all right, Jenna Lloyd would like to ask a question. My video, hi. Hi, Anne, welcome to Madison. Hi. Welcome Bio Madison. Um, I have two questions for you um, that sort of come from the, um, the image that you showed of the freeway construction, um, which brought to mind, um, uh, it looked like it was around the sort of area of town where there had been a great deal of land banking that then turned into decades later, um, new housing. I'm not sure if it's the same space, the Zilber School of Public Health, um, and yep. then also Pfizer Forum decades later. Yep. Yes, it's, it's right there looking south, yep. So my two questions then that sort of come from that um, have to do with how do you think about um, land banking in Du Bois's terms of the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen, and um, the, the state's role as well as the private sector's role in thinking about um, land banking and the sort of willingness to like erase vibrant neighborhoods and existing businesses including what had been part of um, Black Milwaukee and just sit on the land until such a time as decades later, it would become profitable. So that's my first question. And then my second is about um, Pfizer Forum and whether or not we think about uh, where I've been to go watch Bucks games happily. Um, if we think about that as a form of privatized mutuality um, mm -hmm. in that. And the reason I suggest that it could be maybe. Um, so aside from the sort of mo public monies that were raised to create that um, stadium, 
it also, um, the ticket prices are much more expensive now than they had been. And the composition of the crowd is a far different um, composition than, than that of, of Milwaukee. It's far more suburban and white. Um, and so, um, you know, that sort of land banking then uh, ended up supporting this particular um, hierarchical form of, of, um, of sporting entertainment and, um, and certainly the labor that goes along with it. So those are my two questions. Thank you for a great yeah. talk. Yeah, thank you. Those are fantastic questions. Uh, first of all, I really like um, the notion of land banking um, in terms of thinking about privatized mutualities. And I think what that really points towards is the, the temporalities of these relationships that extend um, you know, across generations and into future generations. So these are, these are temporal relations that stretch across time. Um, in really important ways, such that you can have highway reconstruct or highway construction um, that we all know barrels through uh, Bronzeville, uh, vibrant black communities. And actually Reggie Jackson argues that a lot of those communities had already really gone through, they'd already been destroyed through other processes before uh, the roads were built, but nonetheless, the neighborhoods destroyed. Um, and then that the city just sits on the land, um, owns the land and speculates, you know, it, it, until such a time in which it's profitable and meaningful to go ahead and call in those investments. Um, so blank space, abandoned space, space is not being used, is still given a premium over uh, you know, prime real estate um, located you know, right on the border of you know, kind of white downtown Milwaukee and um, the black west side. So I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, think it, I think that that question really points to uh, these, these the long term and the, the the temporalities that exist to produce these kinds of relationships, um, not only of them being past oriented but future oriented. Um, and I think another place we could think about that is being really clear uh, for those folks who are familiar with Milwaukee um, is the area around uh, what is often called um, Yankee Hill. Um, that's in the past. This is the, with the period of what it had been called um, over by MSOE, uh, part of the area that had been entirely cleared uh, for uh, the building of um, the Park East Highway that was never built. That land sat vacant for, I mean, when I moved to Milwaukee in 2008, it was, it was really just open and uh, kind of a, the, this big barren field. And as the years have gone on, we've seen um, this massive buildup around these areas, apartment complexes, everything. Um, and so that, so that again, banking on land, holding land, speculating on land, knowing that it will in future generations um, be you know, worthwhile, this is significant. Um, I think the Buck Stadium is a fantastic example or Pfizer Forum of, um, of uh, privatized mutuality. Uh, weirdly, that was actually the last place I was uh, this week last year. The last thing I ever did took place at Pfizer Forum. Um, and uh, I was and certainly surrounded by many white people at this event. And it has uh, changed uh, the racial, uh, the racial, I wanted to say racial geographies, the topographies the, of, of that whole area, but also who can actually partake in and enjoy um, the, the, the bucks as a players. And so I think given both the, the fact that taxpayers were on the hook, I'm forgetting what the amount is now, is it like 300, 300 million um, to, build, to build this, um, that we will be for some time continuing to pay for a stadium that now really supports and is only available uh, for the public consumption of certain members of, of Milwaukee. I think that's a classic and really perfect example of what I'm trying to get at when I talk about those relations. There's, there's another example that predates that, which is um, Miller Park, uh, which, yep. you know, I mean, I grew up near there and it used to be the case. County Stadium. County Stadium, I mean, which was rented to the brewers for a dollar a year or something like that. But then when the, the specific idea around, it was a very con big controversy. The reason supposedly that they built it there was to appeal or make it more accessible to the suburbs. But who goes to the games, it, it really radically changed. It became so much more expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, so Michael Below has a question. Michael, if you can unmute yourself. Um, hi, uh, Anne, thanks so much for a great talk. Uh, it's very thought provoking. And this is, um, uh, I've 
I've kind of garbled the question. I, I find it very complicated. And so um, any, you know, I apologize in advance for any sort of like lack of clarity and and uh, how I phrase this, but um, in, in, so in my research on uh, dock workers in Milwaukee in the depression era, okay. um, uh, so there's a, you know, there's a pretty extraordinary um, pattern of interracial solidarity on the docks in Milwaukee, which is undermined mm -hmm. in a, in a sort of uh, interesting way by um, ordinary, what you might call sort of like race neutral with quotes, um, uh, class processes in the broader Great Lakes shipping economy um, and not by say the intervention of like white backlash or um, sort of kind of explicit uh, racist ideology or something like that. Um, but this, the undermining of that sort of um, kind of radical interracial project on the docks um, the, the undermining did kind of work through, you use this term articulation and, uh, and you know, sort of invite us to think about the way that um, white supremacy gets articulated to other kinds of uh, systems and ideological um, uh, systems and so on. Uh, in this case, it was uh, articulated to anti-communism, but it was never, it never uh, r rose to the level of exclusionary practices on the docks. Uh, mm -hmm. racial, racially exclusionary practices mm -hmm. on the docks, right? So there is this kind of mm -hmm. like way that, um, uh, you know, so, you know, a kind of genuine, genuine militant interracial project mm -hmm. uh, is um, uh, laid low, not by um, kind of a racial backlash, but by the ordinary ways that um, uh, wage competition among workers in the Great Lakes shipping industry uh, undermines the radical project in that port. Um, you know, among on account of wage competition across ports, right? So I, yeah. I I'm thinking about that as it connects to this in some ways, uh, race considered at the at the sort of at the beginning of your talk, you kind of offered a, a way of thinking about race kind of at the level of like modes of production, right? So like racial capitalism and this kind of way of thinking about it, which I think entails all kinds of like extremely complicated articulations of this sort. Um, and connected, and I'm not sure how this is connected, is um, how we think about like whiteness. Um, and I'm curious about, I, I want you to uh, say more if you can about like these ideas about like multiracial whiteness or multiracial white supremacy. Um, the idea that non-white people, I guess the idea that non-white people uh, can sort of be um, enforcers of the system of white supremacy or be sort of uh, come to have a stake in it themselves or are brought, um, uh, brought or even sort of tokenized uh, by whites uh, to be a part of it. Um, that strikes me as something that's like not, um, not novel or new um, and uh, also takes sort of more, um, more uh, profound forms than like Enrique uh, Tario of the Proud Boys, yeah, right? Yeah. So one, one I, I am reminded for example of like, um, uh, Freddie Gray's murder in Baltimore, um, right. where uh, half of his killers were uh, black officers. The mayor was black. The district attorney was black. Yeah. The chief of police was yeah. black. You know, so on. Um, and you get yeah. this kind of pattern. Uh, and also um, uh, going going uh, quite far back, like the willingness of even ideological racists to sort of single out, um, you know, good ones, if you like, uh, you know, uh, acceptable. Uh, um, sort of specimens of uh, the lower orders of races who, who in some ways sort of um, uh, are, are sort of leveraged to make some point about, about whiteness or about Western civilization or whatever else. And I guess I'm wondering if multiracial whiteness uh, is the best way to make sense of this kind of practice. Um, if we think about, if we're already thinking about race um, as kind of articulated at the sort of mode of production level. Um, and so, uh, I, I guess I, I guess I what I want to offer as like a, a potential alternative is sort of uh, doubling down on that sort of idea of articulation. And so, like, um, I, I really loved the photo you had of the like white Power Ranger people with the sort of private property signs, you know, which is this is this is like the absolute kind of standard um, uh, articulation one finds in like white backlash uh, movements. Is there's this articulation to um, private property rights and an ideology of uh, private property. Um, and that works in part because it's, it's, it overlaps with whiteness, but it also keeps going. Like it's much bigger. It has this other kind of um, uh, direction to it uh, in, in such a way that non-white people 
can be in fact brought to have a stake in a system in which private property is upheld. Um, and so on and can come to have a stake in a system in which white supremacy is a key stabilizing element, right? So there's this, um, there is this kind of like, uh, uh, I guess, way in which historically um, you have this sort of um, articulation playing out. Uh, and I, it strikes me as quite old. Uh, the multiracial whiteness idea seems to try to be describing something new, which appears to me to be quite old. I guess I'm uh, curious to hear you elaborate on that concept and um, the sort of theme of articulation and sort of how to make sense of these kinds of processes. Thanks. Okay, uh, yes, there's there's a lot there. Um, first of all, your research sounds fascinating and um, I would love to hear more about it. Um, and uh, I tomorrow in my conversation and really um, with some of my, uh, my projects um, that I'll talk about tomorrow, um, I'm really thinking more about the earlier portions of the 20th century um, in Milwaukee. Um, and, and yes, uh, one of the things that's really, really fascinating about Milwaukee's history, even um, leading up to these struggles over public housing, uh, which I'm gonna talk about tomorrow, is the way in which um, that the unions were really, really active in supporting uh, demands for, for public housing, actually um, not, and not all unions, but um, the CIU in particular, um, they played a significant role. They attended the protests. Um, and so I, my use of the term, and I, so I'm just no, you know, kind of pointing to the complexity. And in Milwaukee, the complexity is particularly unique because of uh, the predominance of European immigrants. Uh, there's, you know, we, when we talk about whiteness in Milwaukee and we have to talk about these kinds of articulations and formations, we have to situate that, especially in the early 20th century, within the context of, you know, extraordinary uh, ethnic diversity, uh, but also within socialist politics, socialist and labor politics which are, you know, critically important here. Um, in terms of your question about um, multiracial whiteness, multicultural whiteness, these terms that are being deployed, de being deployed now, um, I think it's important to situate those terms. Um, these are not meant to, I mean, I do agree that, that, that we can see the way in which um, whiteness has always been incorporating other kinds of groups at various moments um, to various ends. Um, when I use that term and when I brought it up today, I really am using it in very contemporary ways. Um, I'm talking about um, the, the kind of orientation of the state. So it's not as, and, and the way in which racism is understood. So, so I think there's a couple of points that speak to kind of what you're getting at. First and foremost is the fact that the state is officially, and here I'm really, really drawing from the work of Jody Melamed, um, Hosang and Martinez, people that are really thinking about contemporary racial regimes and the way that they're being reconfigured. Um, and, and that is that uh, the state takes a different role at, at this point in time than they did in the past. Um, and that the way that we understand racism also plays a critical role here. That um, racism has been deregulated, if we wanna use that term. Um, it's been deregulated to the individual um, in, in ways that uh, make uh, uh, you know these, these pernicious problems that we talk about consistently people understand racism as individual rather than structuralism. And at the same time, uh, as the state is officially anti-racist, as I know, there's this, there's this adoption, this embrace of colorblindness um, that means something about the way in which people understand race and the way in which they make claims about race in this particular moment. So um, I'm not sure if I'm getting to your point, but I am really saying that I think that, that, that the concept it is more expansive that we know that this isn't a new phenomenon, that this has always been the case in terms of uh, whiteness exceeding white um, and, and the ways in which different moments, uh, regimes of labor or regimes of accumulation shape the way those articulations, if you want to use that term, happen. Um, but when I use the term, I'm really trying to think about uh, this moment, um, and, and and I use Enrique Tario, um, I agree, that's not the best example. I, I put his picture up there, but I did wanna kind of think about the fact that, um, that, that the contemporary whiteness and white supremacy is in, appealing to folks in new ways, in part because of the way that this enduring language about property rights, which we know is extended, this is nothing new also, but the way it's being framed at this particular moment, um, along with this idea of race, uh, makes it unique. This is what I'm trying to argue. I don't know if I'm getting at your question, but I'd love to hear more about your work. So uh, you know, I, please reach out because um, it sounds like there's a lot of overlap and more things we can discuss. 
Great. All right. Um, anybody else? I have nobody in the queue currently, uh, so the, the floor is open. Would anybody like to venture a question? Don't hesitate. I, I'm not sure if I can raise my hand, Patrick, because of the way that I got into this meeting, but I do oh. have a, a, a quick question. There's no other questions. Yeah, well, we, go ahead, and then we're going to have Jenna. She's got another question. Oh, I'll I'll I'll, I'll move out of the way for Jenna. <laughs> All right, for from one geographer to another, and then we'll back to the other geographer. I was so. like, Keith, you haven't asked a question yet, though. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Okay, fine. Um, so um, I have another question now. Um, that I imagine others might be wondering about too. So which at some, towards the end of your talk, you, you discussed resisting the leveraging of crisis. Um, and so I wonder um, if you might talk a bit more about that, um, of maybe distinguishing between how it is that we might be dis might distinguish between um, crisis as a tool for governance um, versus the sort of more systemic, enduring um, experiences of, of people's vulnerability and how those are the, yeah. these sort of like material experiences of crisis that create the conditions for yeah. premature death. Um, yeah. Because it seems like sometimes when people say, hey, we've um, been in crisis for a long time, that's not being recognized. Like that's a sort of legitimate um, in my yeah. perspective, um, political yeah. claim to to using crisis. So, I if you could mm -hmm. talk more through through that. Thank you. That's really helpful, and um, and and as I, I think that that's a flaw in the way that I I, I framed that part at the end. In that um, I was referencing, yeah, as you noted, these kind of um, large scale these crises in capitalism, crises in reproduction. Um, and the way in which, you know, at this moment, of course, you know, for example, the crisis of white supremacy, folding white supremacy, framing white supremacy as political extremism and as a form of terrorism as a way then to roll out and intensify, you know, roll out new programs for monitoring terrorists to expand uh, the carceral state. Um, there's an example of what I, what I was referring to these, like, okay, we have to respond to this now. And this is what, or we're going to create the George Floyd, uh, you know, bill of criminal justice reform. I don't remember its exact title. And in it, it's going to involve um, expansive funding of policing, um, which is, you know, there are these these are countless examples that we could talk about right now. But that stands in opposition, I guess, to kind of the everyday crises that people are uh, very acutely feeling right now. Um, the crisis of not having a place to stay, the crisis of um, being sick and um, needing to go to your work, you know, those are real crises. And I think what I what I would say to that is that it is these kinds of mutualities that I was trying to, you know, that, that I think that are responding to these everyday crises that people encounter because of these systems that uh, suggest ways forward, ways that we might um, disrupt these larger patterns. And so, you know, in the in that picture that I shared of uh, Ayuda Mutata, um, their work, they they were immediately mobilizing. As soon as I, I, I picked that picture, I couldn't believe the date, March 27th, they had already organized, March 27th of last year, they'd already organized a whole system of, of food provisioning. And, you know, this is before, I mean, before the city or anybody else could figure out how to maneuver. Um, and so I think, yeah, I guess just speaking back to your point, the way that I framed crisis there at the end doesn't speak to those kind of, I don't even know if I wanna call it a dual nature, the fact that we have, uh, we have these larger systemic crises um, that uh, prompt, you know, immediate responses and governance that reinforce these existing systems versus these on the ground lived experience of crises um, and the ways in which organizations and groups are mobilizing like right now to make sure that someone has something to eat. 
or lay their head. All right, Keith, you get the last question, please do. <laughs> I'm happy to stand out of the way if anybody else has a question. Okay, I, you know, I, um, I think I just, um, I may be asking the same question um, that Jenna and a couple of other people have asked. Um, uh, but um, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested maybe just in it at the conceptual level um, about the, your use of the concept of contingency, um, which you use to sort of explain the, the trend, the sort of the, what seems to be a change in, in white supremacy and in identifications with white supremacy. Um, maybe historically it's actually not, maybe we're just actually getting light on the, the real history of it um, as contingent. But, um, and of course, all of these, all of the nuances and complexities of um, uh, the, in relation to the crisis question that you were just answering from Jenna, of course, has everything to do with contingency as well. Um, and I guess it's, it's not terribly surprising to see um, uh, in some ways, radical politics orienting itself towards um, crisis and contingency regularly. Mm -hmm. um, it's less it's less normal to see um, uh, the sort of the the fascistic dimensions of polit politicalities oriented towards contingency as well. Right. Normally, it's, yeah. it's oriented towards necessitarian sort of ideologies. So um, I'm just wondering. I, I love that, by the way. I think it's really interesting and. Um, uh, uh, it, mind-bendingly interesting. Um, but I'm wondering, do we now need, as social theorists, do we need more a more nuanced language about contingency at this point? Have we reached the point mm. where, I mean, given, I mean, you know, critiques of capital, given like even bringing contingency into thinking about um, the membership of white supremacist yeah. movements, which is bonkers, right? Do we need yeah. now to, to re, Imagine how it is that we're thinking contingency, so we can think about yeah. its um, its uh, radical and fascistic dimensions. Yeah, it's that's a really I, I that's a really interesting question, and I want to sit with it more. Thank you all for this feedback. This this concept of privatized mutuality is new for me, and it, as I mentioned earlier, it's just this way that I'm trying to think through these kinds of relations, and I appreciate the feedback as I move forward with it. Yeah, I mean, I really in terms of your question, like what isn't contingent, right? <laughs> it's like, I mean, and I think this is the point that you're making. Um, when, when everything's contingent and when we're making these qualifications that, you know, X is contingent on this and this, then it does raise the question of um, how we might uh, look for different vocabularies or ways of thinking about things um, that, that captures, um, the cap I, I can't even think of another word of contingency in responding to our need for new lexicons of contingency. Um, but um, the way in which these kind of complex processes articulate the way that they're mobilized for different means for different groups at different moments, I think um, does, does suggest that. And uh, I'm not sure what that language is. I'm, I'm interested in hearing it, but um, yeah, I... I any suggestions, any ideas that you're thinking? I and mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Um, but yeah, I, I do think, I mean, if everything's contingent, then what does contingency mean anymore? So. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to pull the, the rug out under that um, at all. I'm just, no. I think it's like, do we need a new kind of, a, le yeah. a new lexicon of contingency, you know? Yeah. Um, for radical politics. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's a good, I, I think that's a good place for us to end and think about. I mean, unless there are other questions, because I'm not sure that I can respond more at this point, but I want to continue to think about that. And I think that you, you raise a really critical issue. Uh, I think especially pointing to the fact that contingency can orient us in multiple ways. Um, <laughs> and we're really seeing that right now um, in, in really profound um, and, and in meaningful ways. All right, well, we have reached our, our, our time and um, that is a good place to stop, I think. I just wanna remind people, well, first of all, thank you very much for both the talk and the conversation. It was really stimulating um, and promise of really great um, talk and conversation tomorrow. And the title for tomorrow's talk, again, is, or maybe I hadn't said this already, Possessive Whiteness, Racism, Property and Power in the Making of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And if I may offer a personal note, um, I'm really looking forward to it. I grew up in Milwaukee. Uh, my family was deeply involved in the civil rights movement, including the fair housing struggle. 
So I'm really looking forward to this and I anticipate that many of you are too. All right, so thanks, Anne, and a really warm welcome to everybody to return tomorrow, same time, same Zoom link. So. All right, um, see you tomorrow, hopefully. All right, take care. Bye everybody.